closing keynote speaker of the day. He's well-versed in the world of space and its future. A retired Lieutenant General Stephen Quast. General Quast stepped away from the uniform last fall in his last post as commander of the Air Education and Training Command in San Antonio. Uh, an interesting fact is that he was raised in a small village in Cameroon for the first 10 years of his life. Uh, which, sir, I hope you'll touch on a little bit as you expound uh, this afternoon. Um, he received his commission upon graduation from the Air Force Academy in 86. He was a pilot with 33 years of service. He's a highly decorated officer with over 600 combat flight hours logged. He has a degree in aeronautical engineering and master's in public policy, uh, perhaps part of the driving factor behind his support and advocacy for the development of space whether through lectures about emerging technology or leading the effort in future policy, he's built a career that's created a perfect launching pad for space defense. Uh, sir, with that, I'll turn it over to you. Welcome. Wonderful. Well, what an exciting conversation to have. And uh, as you all in this conversation have already heard, uh, this is really an epic journey of humanity because for the first time in the history of mankind, we have the knowledge, both engineering, scientific, and business knowledge to be able to start reaching to the stars for many of the things that human beings need uh, to be effective and to be happy. And uh, so to be on this journey and to be the activists, if you will, helping people understand what this can mean is just a joy. And uh, that's why I'm so grateful to be a part of this. What I'd like to do uh, over the next few minutes is unpack what this journey means and give some tangible examples and, and then open it up for questions so that we can really get after what you're curious about. Uh, but ultimately, the, the promise at the end of this is each of us uh, go out there and we light our own little fire under the friends, the family, the business relationships, the networks of people we know so that the entire human race starts understanding what we're getting after and specifically America. Uh, because ultimately, it, you know, as was mentioned by Tim, if, if America leads this, American values will be ushered into the next century. Um, but if others lead it, their values will be ushering in uh, the next century. Uh, and uh, we can get more into that later with regard to, to um, who leads it and what that will mean. But you know, my, my background, uh, both in understanding technology, understanding policy, understanding leadership of large organizations and innovation, as well as understanding culture. You know, my background being raised in an African tribe gave me a, uh, a real gift. And the gift was to be able to see the cultural impediments to change. You know, I can see very clearly how one society views things and, and how easy it is to get stuck into a mindset. But this is not just a mindset that America gets stuck in, it's the entire world. And I'll give you a quick analogy. Imagine you are all sitting here right now and it's 1898. And all of you are essentially lighting your homes with candles. You are heating your home with a pot belly stove. You are getting to and from work on your horse. And I come in and I tell you that within 100 years, uh, everybody's going to have a phone in their pocket. There'll be a man on the moon. You will have uh, electricity in your home to light it with wires that are coming uh, and you won't need a candle and that you'll have two cars in every garage and there'll be a road to everywhere. And if you have to go more than about a day driving your car, you'll fly. You know, that uh, you would have either thought that I was, you know, the kind interpretation, you would have thought that, well, that guy's way out in the future and, uh, you know, that maybe a hundred thousand years, or you would have burned me at the stake, depending on your uh, proclivities. But it, it is an example uh, of how stuck we can get and how things are and really underappreciate how technology changes history. And it changes history, not only in changing the fate of humanity and what it has done is uplifted the human condition over time, but it also uh, changes the, uh, the, the way we think about what is in the art of the possible. And it builds on itself. And that's why the, it's such a great journey to uh, hand this off to the next generation and let them build on it. Just like Einstein built on Newton 
and uh, and and uh, scientists today are building on Einstein and uh, going into quantum. And we'll touch on that just a little bit too, because of the power of quantum in space. But let me start by uh, defining what's going on uh, with regard to the arc of history and remind you of several principles that are playing out right now that will really help you tell this story. If you go back to the caveman age and, and, you, and, and you read any history that's available to us on the 22 great civilizations that have existed, what you'll notice is two interesting things. One is that no civilization has lasted forever. And two, what you'll notice is there are three principles that drive a civilization to do great things. And, and it comes back to this other reality of life and that, that is everything is competitive. Life is a competition. It's a competition to bring resources to yourself so you can have shelter, food and water. It's a, it's a competition for the security to make sure nobody can steal that away from you so you can feed your family and protect your loved ones. It is the, the struggle and the competition for information. You know, what is true and what's really going on around me so that I can know what to do so that my actions are not counter to my survival. And then the fourth and probably the most powerful competition is this competition to belong. We need to belong to something as human beings. And the, the need to belong is actually more powerful than the need to survive. If that were not true, you would never have somebody jumping on a hand grenade in a foxhole to save their brothers and sisters in arms. The need to belong to a group, whether it's your family, your neighborhood, your culture, your sports team, your political party, this is why we get so crazy when it comes to loyalty and belonging to a team. And I set this conversation in that context to help everybody realize that what is playing out right now with the opportunity of space to bless the human race in ways we can't even imagine is set on this foundation of competition where the more competitive society that actually achieves this strategic high ground first is going to receive the preponderance of blessing to a disproportionate extent. Uh, it would be like England figuring out shipbuilding and deep sea navigation and it allowed them the disproportionate economic advantage of ruling the global economy for as many years as they did. Technology is powerful and competition is real. And we are in a competition right now with China, with Russia, with India, with, with any other country because we're all sovereign national entities. We are in a competition for the high ground of space. And that competition can either be a peaceful, joyful journey for the human race, or it can be devastating. It's like the competition where when Hitler knew that scientists thought they could build a nuclear bomb, he put all his money and his scientists after that, and it was a competition. And thank God America beat him to the punch, or we all might be speaking German right now under a totalitarian regime called Nazism. And, um, and life would be very different than it is today. So competition matters. And I want you to keep that forefront in your mind as we talk about these three principles that are playing out. So these principles are essentially the things that make you competitive as you are reaching for a new opportunity, whether it's in anything in life. And the first one, and one of the most powerful ones is transportation. If you can get the right people to the right place at the right time for the right reason, faster and cheaper than your competition, you will, you will usually win over time as long as you use it consistent with a strategy that is mindful of your competitor. So let's talk about space just a little bit here, okay? Even five years ago, as I was pounding the table in the Air Force, trying to let them be convinced that the technology is there for reusability, meaning that you can actually build a rocket that is like an aircraft where you can use it to go to space and then refuel it when it lands back on Earth. And the predominant mindset was, you're a futurist, you're 100 years too soon, you know, you're crazy, uh, stop working in Buck Rogers' world and, and world of fantasy land and science fiction. And uh, wouldn't you know, 
you know, you watch those two first stages landing from Elon Musk back in Florida. It was such a thing of beauty. And those that watch technology and the changes in the trends of technology knew that was coming for the last 10 years. It was just a matter of time. But the traditional status quo bureaucracy does not think that way or look that way. And it's not their fault. The bureaucracy is intended to make what works today perfect. And so they spend all their money and their time refining the current ideology, the, the current methodology, the current mindset to just be incrementally better. And they are very poor by design, by human nature, to jump to a different economic curve, which is what Elon Musk did and what others are doing as well. So let's talk about transportation. Uh, right now, you have the bureaucracy starting to recognize this, and they are, uh, they are talking about point-to-point -point transportation on the terrestrial realm in less than an hour, which the, you know, Elon Musk can do easily once he starts deploying the Starship. Uh, but others are right there on his heels, and uh, it will be many that will do this. It's like the automobile. Uh, before Henry Ford, they were kind of um, a novelty. And like was pointed out earlier, when a car came into a, a, a town, uh, it was the event of the year. Everybody came out to see this machine that could propel itself, and it was a novelty. And then very soon it came, became pedestrian. So just as it is pedestrian to fly, just as you heard with the last speaker, Tim, uh, it will be pedestrian to go to Singapore from Los Angeles in 37 minutes because you just uh, step out on the barge, you go up into the rocket and uh, you're landing on a barge outside of Singapore in, in 37 minutes. And you don't think anything of it because that's just the way we do it. Um, transportation, the ability to take the right person or thing to the right place at the right time for the right reason, transforms economies. It transforms human ability to do things. Think about what we can do to rescue and save, to bring uh, needed humanitarian aid or help uh, to people around the globe in time to actually do something to avoid catastrophe. Uh, the, the ability to uplift the human condition and do beautiful things for humanity using space uh, is really profound. Yet, even to this day, as I talk to businesses and uh, communities, uh, mayors and governors, when I tell them they can move, they can be in one spot on the earth and be in another spot in less than an hour, they scratch their head and they cannot figure out what that means. It, it's totally outside of their world paradigm. And I, and I see that clearly because of growing up in one world paradigm in a tribal African uh, uh, community. And then my dad moving to Los Angeles and uh, being a teenager in Los Angeles, talk about a, a ripping my world apart. Uh, and, but it, it taught me how to see these things and how to communicate. So space is gonna transform transportation and whoever is the leader at that transportation where speed matters, you know, time is money, uh, time is economic power, the opportunity to get to the right place at the right time with the right person or thing at the, uh, with a, for the right reason, it transforms the business case of uh, beating your competition. And then if you can get the price down to something that the masses can use like Henry Ford did for the automobile or what Steve Jobs did for the pocket computer called the iPhone, um, and that's coming. And you know, another point to make here is that most people that are in leadership positions, like our president, our governors, you know, with a few exceptions, they, they, they grew up in an industrial age and they do not have a good feel for the temporal dimension of our current in, uh, information age. And what I mean by that is the pace of change has kind of a rhythm to it. And so the World War II generation could afford to wait for Pearl Harbor and then turn to the industrial base and say, okay, build me a Navy and an Army and an Air Force big enough to crush Japan and Germany, who are our belligerents. And we had time to build that up over the years and then crush them. In the digital age, in this networked information age, the speed of change, the temporal dimension of change is so rapid that these old habits are uh, gonna be a real problem if we don't acknowledge speed as a true element of competitive advantage. So I'll talk to people in Congress about space and space transportation and they'll say, well, 
we got time. You know, Elon Musk hasn't even deployed the Starship. And if China starts using that technology to change the world, then we'll just turn to our industrial base and say, do it. And they don't realize that one, you can't just flip a switch on these things. It take, there are certain things that take time. Capital investment and engineering just physically takes time to build the machine to do something. And space has such a disproportionate power delta that if China is up there with a fleet of starships and a fleet of satellites that can beam power, power generation stations, refueling stations that can move without Delta V regret outside of the gravity well and orbits into cislunar space and beyond, you can't catch up. <laughs> you, you know, the ability to catch up uh, will take more than just years because of the time it takes and the delta of power. It would be like France trying to win World War II just with the Maginot Line, which is the wall that they invested in. They, you know, they basically, their theory was they will win World War II against Germany by building a wall so thick and so tall with guns so powerful that nobody will be able to penetrate. And of course, Germany had a superior strategy of Blitzkrieg and they had maneuver and they just went north of the wall and Paris fell in three weeks. Well, I'm here to tell you that if China dominates the high ground of space first with dominant transportation, America could fall in three days. And we'll, we'll get to that later, but that's not the point of this conversation. This conversation is to talk about the grand strategy here of what can be done in humanity if we choose to take this path. And so transportation is that first level of, of um, principle that I want to just reflect on here. And to uh, when you tell the story, you tell the story of the horse in 1898 that had a certain temporal dimension, a certain speed, and a certain uh, uh, capital investment. You know, you had to buy the horse, you had to feed the horse. Well, there's capital investment or anything, but the person that had the automobile that was affordable could out, you know, outdo the horse 100 to one because what you could carry and the distance you could travel um, and uh, the operations and maintenance cost lower based on the capability that you brought to bear. The capability just made it an unfair fight. Now, one warning on this and each of the other two principles I'm gonna talk about, but here's the warning and I'll use a historical analogy for this. When you usher something new in, the bureaucracy will fight you tooth and nail. And here's how, the, here's how they fought the train and the automobile because it was gonna displace the horse. It was gonna disrupt the horse industry. And there's stories, these are such fun stories. The story of how sailmakers and, and, and uh, that, that made sails and ships hated the idea of a coal or oil powered ship because it was gonna disrupt the sail making industry or the horse industry. And you know, so here's, here's the story on the horse industry. And this will help you as you tell people the story of how technology will disrupt the past and it will usher in a new opportunity that will make people, well, back in the day, millionaires, then billionaires. And space is gonna have the first trillionaire on planet earth because of, again, it's differential power. But here's a story on how you have to be careful because the status quo will fight you tooth and nail. When when the automobile and the train were first being invented and they were showing effectiveness to really displace the horse, England wrote a law prohibiting any train or any automobile from traveling any faster than a horse. Can you believe that? Uh, here, here's, uh, so that's England. Uh, and, and so, but you know, there for the grace of God, here's an American story. When uh, the cavalry uh, in 1937 and 1938 was looking at Blitzkrieg and there was this argument going on. Do you invest in mechanization or do you invest in the horse to beat Germany? That fight was vicious. I mean, we, we all didn't live in that area, so we, we forget these stories. But as a historian, reading these stories about innovation, about how technology changes world history and changes fate and can either uplift or crush the human uh, prosperity. What happened in America is, 
you can make studies say anything. We know that statistics can lie and uh, they, can, they can deceive as, as, as powerfully as they can reveal truth. And one of my favorite studies in 1938 is the study that proves without a shadow of a doubt that if you take the horse off the battlefield, the IQ of the soldier will drop dramatically. Now we all laugh at that, but that's how powerful the mindset is. So as you start telling stories about ushering in a transportation revolution that space will bring to the human race and how America can be the first trillionaires by being the ones that essentially usher in the equivalent of the automobile, the train and the ship combined for global economic commerce. You're gonna have all of those industries fighting you tooth and nail because it will disrupt their profit margin and the capital investment they have already put in place over the decades to make themselves profitable and their shareholders profitable. And it's tied to Congress and lobbyists that wanna keep those jobs. So it's not just the status quo. It is the, as Eisenhower warned us against, the industrial, military, congressional complex. And one little historical footnote on that, when, you read, when he gave the speech as he was leaving office and warning the future to be cautious of the military industrial complex, when you take a look at the notes of his original drafted speech that he wrote by hand, it included Congress in there. It was the congressional military industrial complex because he understood this habit of human nature where when you invent something that's useful, you put people to work building that useful thing. And those people feed their children building that useful thing. And they vote for politicians that go to Congress that perpetuate that useful thing. And how dare you ever try to disrupt that useful thing because you are stealing food out of the mouths of babies. And that is true. But if you don't make this change, if you're not willing to change and adapt to be relevant to where we are in history, you lose your entire nation. You become the France that invested in that wall and those guns so fervently that you missed the technology that made your entire investment irrelevant. So if we just invest in tanks, ships, and planes, for example, in the military, the domain that I know so intimately, and China in, invests in transportation modalities using space, you can kiss all those other investments goodbye. I don't care how many tanks, how many ships, how many planes you build. They will be crushed by the speed and the lethality of what space can bring. So you gotta be there with China in space to protect those capital investments. So your deterrence is such that nobody messes with your ships, tanks, and planes because you've got space as the ultimate checkmate if China tries to do anything malicious. Okay, so I've spent quite a bit of time on this first principle. I will spend half the time on the other two principles because many of the subtle side points I made on transportation will apply to these other two, such as the temporal dimension and the fact that the status quo will fight you and that you have to understand how powerful these changes are gonna to be to the competitive environment of the global economy. And ultimately that's really what will keep America safe is a strong economy. The military is a lagging indicator. You have a strong military when you have a strong economy. If you don't have a strong economy, I don't care how clever you are, a civilization with a stronger economy will crush you eventually. And America proved that out with Japan and Germany in World War II. So the second principle, the first principle I talked about was transportation, how it changes world history, it changes fate, and it changes the economy of whoever dominates uh, the new capability. And space is dramatically different. And it will just, it'll be again, more powerful than the invention of the automobile, the plane and the train combined and the ship, all of them. Okay, the second principle of competition is the ability to communicate. So th this is a tough one, okay? And just look at our elections right now. It, it's, as we look around, it's hard to know what truth is, you know? Who's telling the truth? Uh, we have been polarized where you either believe this far extreme or this other far extreme, and there's nothing in between. And if you're on this end and I'm on this end, you're the enemy and you're evil. And if you're on the other end, the other end is enemy and the evil. And, and 
the media love to pit us against one another using that loyalty factor where the need to belong, the desire to belong is so powerful that you'll do just about anything to be true to your team, loyal to your team. So they use that because it sells paper. There's nothing more dramatic and inflammatory than to be able to write a story that says, Joe over there hates Bill over there because they're at the opposite ends of this conversation. And there's no incentive for the media or our information systems to tell a balanced story in the middle where everybody's getting along and compromising with reasonable strategies that make everybody winners. So information is one of those things that is at the key foundation of good competition. Meaning if you wanna compete, you have gotta know what's going on around you. And if your competition can distort your perception of truth or your perception of reality, it, it's as if they can put blinders on a horse and they can maneuver outside of your vision and do whatever they want. In fact, they can lead that horse to slaughter and the horse won't even know. That's what happens if you do not own and dominate information in a way where you can discover and know truth and you can rely on that truth. Otherwise you will be like a sheep led to slaughter because you cannot see truth. So this investment in communication has been a long journey as well. Indians that had smoke signals, okay, could communicate at longer distances and faster than their fellow tribes that had to ride a horse to the other hill to communicate what was going on. So speed is one of those common themes that we'll draw across all of these, whether it's transportation, we talked about the speed of transportation, the speed of communication. And we are in an age right now where we're like clumsy teenagers because we, in the industrial age, we built up all these technologies that help us communicate, but we built them with a strategic framework that made them free and open. So now we're trying to stuff that genie back into the bottle and say, well, wait a minute, I want the internet, but I want security. And I want my data to be perfectly protected. So nobody steals my identity, my money, my reputation, all of which are happening. It's a sieve of discovery for anybody that's savvy in any way, shape or form with cyber. So here we are trying to make something we built that was designed to be free and open into something that we can protect our data. And we will, we will go bankrupt before we are able to do that. It, it's, it's a fool's errand. It would like, it, because when you design something with a certain purpose in mind, to try to change the DNA of that pur purpose is exorbitantly expensive. The analogy I use that, you know, is not a very good analogy, but it, it actually uh, kind of gives you a visual description of how difficult this is. It would be like taking a donkey. A donkey was born and bred to do a certain thing. And you wanna turn that donkey into a giraffe because you wanna eat the, the leaves at the high end of the tree. All the surgeries in the world are not gonna turn that donkey into a giraffe. Only two things will happen. Uh, the donkey will die and it will be ugly. It's better to start with a clean slate and build something with strategic intent designed in to the artistic design of its purpose. And that's what has to happen eventually, but that's what space does for us with regard to communication. And quantum and artificial intelligence and supercomputing and on um, assist lunar processing makes space a place where you can communicate ubiquitously, meaning you can, you, you can communicate anywhere in cis lunar space. And it doesn't matter whether there's a celestial body between you and the person you're trying to communicate with, whether it's the moon or the sun, or the earth or an asteroid, the ubiquitous capability to have an architecture in space where you can communicate and you can use quantum and you can use other designs of gateways that allow you to actually protect your data. Meaning that if you trust the person that's trying to communicate with you, that you can receive a communication from them and you can tell whether it's been tampered with and whether you can trust it or not. Now, we will never be able to overcome the trust of another human being. That's something that uh, artificial intelligence and all the quantum in the world is not going to change. But we will always have the human element. And if you can trust your brother, we can build technology 
that you can trust the communication you're getting from that brother or sister. And you, you build it in space where there can be no impediments to its ability to reach any point anywhere at the speed of light or with quantum faster than the speed of light. As you all know, if you entangle an atom here and or a, a subatomic particle here and you, uh, you align it and entangle it with one here, if they're a hundred miles apart, it takes light a few milliseconds to get to that hundred miles. So it travels at the speed of light with quantum it happens instantly, zero latency. We don't even understand why or how, what's going on. We know dark matter has something to do with it. We just don't understand. And that's the beauty of science is we discover more and more how much we don't know as we move on. But communication is on the verge of greatness. But again, life is about competition. And China is smart, they understand that if you can out, uh, out maneuver your adversary, so the transportation conversation, and if you can out communicate your adversary, and meaning you can deceive them from seeing truth and you can guarantee that you see truth, now you can manipulate their actions. You can perpetuate a lie. So 5G is the first embodiment of how China is trying to control the world information narrative and had we done, uh, had, had the coronavirus hit in 10 years, and if we as an American society had done nothing to try to jump to a different curve on communication, China's lie that they told last spring that the coronavirus was planted by the United States military in China as a deliberate attack against the Chinese people, we as an American society would not have been able to counter that story with our big tech our big data and our, 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 uh, our, our uh, newspapers and our media and Hollywood. We were able to tell the truth and the world was able to look at that and say, okay, I, I believe that American military did not plant this virus. But imagine if there was no way of telling the truth that, that 5G and China's global satellite ubiquitous cislunar capability to manipulate every electron coming out of every 4G LTE device or any device that goes through any of the traditional internet gateways or SCADA systems we've built to date. They can make the text you're sending me say anything they want. And I get that text and I'm like, oh my God, I thought Jill uh, was my friend and she hates me. So I text back and say, Jill, what's going on? But Jill doesn't get that text. She gets a text that says, you know, right back at you. I hate you too. Turning sister against sister, brother against brother nation against nation. The ability to control truth and the perception of reality and information is at the key of competition. You've got to have it or you will lose. And China bankrupted Motorola, Lucent Technologies, and Nortel to build Huawei and 5G. And we are scrambling to catch up. But if we do not use space as the ubiquitous network that can see around celestial bodies and is not tied to terrestrial investments of cell towers, we will lose that fight. Because with just a handful of satellites, you can communicate to anybody on planet Earth. But right now, the way we build it, you got to build cell towers across the Earth, and that's expensive. Much cheaper to build a ubiquitous gateway of network communication using space. And that's why Elon Musk is putting up his satellites to give you Wi-Fi from space. But what is America, what is the American citizen getting with regard to the government partnering with our private companies to build communication capability that defends America's data? Just like we built the Panama Canal to help the American economy in the open oceans by cutting the travel time in half and cutting the cost in half. What are we doing to help us protect our data and truth so we know what actions actually achieve our ultimate end state. So I've talked about transportation and maneuver. I've talked about communication. And it, it would be like communicating uh, in uh, 1898 by getting on your horse and, draw, and, and, and uh, galloping to your neighbor's house and telling them the story and having to compete with somebody that has a cell phone and uh, a smartphone and can communicate via voice, text, email uh, with that person at the speed of light. 
that's how powerful the difference can be. And that's what China is building and uh, what we are not. And uh, so this is uh, why space is so important in the communication principle. Then the third one and uh, the final one for any major competition between individual people, tribes, cities, states, nations, civilizations is power, energy. Electricity is what most people will think of, but it's, it's, it's power. Um, energy drives economic development. Energy uh, matters, whether it's food in your body to give you energy, it's the firing of the electrons in any of these domains or the fuel of uh, energy. It's a foundation for any competition. So here's why space is so powerful. So back in the day, I talked about um, you're lighting your house with candles and you're heating your home with a pot belly stove. And today, if you're lucky and smart, you're powering your home with solar power you're heating your water with solar power in your home. You're, uh, you're doing all kinds of things with uh, geothermal and solar and, uh, and green energy or fossil fuel energy, but you've got energy on demand, on command, anytime you want. What space can do for energy? And I'll use a small example here. This takes energy, this little device that we use to communicate and, uh, and do all kinds of useful things. Imagine if you can trickle charge this using radio waves that have, been, that have been modified from solar energy into radio waves that are safe for human beings, like your FM, AM radio. And it trickle charges 24 seven, just like you get GPS 24 seven, energy and information are one and the same. Now we'd have to build different devices, but we know how to build them. We know how to build devices where energy could be stored up in batteries and capacitors over time to power cars, planes, ships, phones, anything, any device you want. And if you have a constellation in cislunar space, you can beam energy to energize anything, anybody. And you can do it for the entire terrestrial realm as well. Now look at the investments we make in energy right now. You gotta build a power plant, whether it's nuclear or fossil fuel, or whatever source, and then you got to build power lines to take that power to every individual home and all the transformers to step it down so it doesn't kill you. And even then, it's expensive. The fossil fuel pollutes the earth unless you're doing nuclear, but then you have the spent uranium rods that are a danger to humanity. Or you're, de you know, you're, you, you're doing, either way, we do energy very caveman-like in our current industrial age. And space could usher in a new era where energy is clean, it's abundant to every person, and it does not require the huge capital investment of a power generation plant and power lines going to every single home. Just like with going wireless with telecommunications, we can go wireless with energy. And it's as safe for people as your FM, AM radio, or putting it in another way, it is much less dangerous than sunlight to your physiology and your biology. So energy, whoever owns energy first in space will have such a powerful um, advantage that it will be an unfair fight. It would be like somebody owning a castle in the medieval ages, building a wall and a moat around the castle and I have an airplane that I can fly overhead and drop a bomb in the middle of it. Now, this is competition, okay? So guess what? If China stays on its promises of milestones and capability delivery, which they have been true to consistently for the last 30 years with regard to space, if they stay on this 30 year trend of behavior, within the next decade, they will have a nuclear power generation plant in space and a solar power generation plant in space, beaming energy all over the place. The problem, of course, for a national security professional is that they talk about that being for people, uh, peaceful purposes. And I love that fact. Now, if I have this device in the middle of uh, an African jungle, 
I can still communicate because I can get energy. But in a millisecond, that beamed energy can be turned up and become a weapon of war. It can paralyze a fleet of F-35s on the ramp in Guam or a carrier battle group sailing in the South China Sea. There is no limit to what you can do to a society that's built vulnerability into its SCADA systems and its electronics with directed energy. If it is designed <clears throat> to be dual use, where it can be used to peacefully energize devices that are useful for people, or it can be turned up and used as a weapon of war or paralyzation, where they can say, well, I'll turn off your electricity until you do what I want you to do. I'll paralyze your power grid in New York City until you take away these tariffs. You can see how maliciously power can be used in both senses of the word. So there we have it. Three principles of competition that space will transform in ways that no terrestrial linear delivery of information, transportation, or energy can compete with. And whoever gets there first and builds this infrastructure will rule the economy of the globe for the next thousand years. And they will also bring their values in. So we either have the values of our constitution and the fact that every human being has equal value and that truth matters, or you will have what happens to the Uyghurs and the Tibetans and Hong Kong, where people are subjugated to the fact that the party is the only thing that has power. And if you ever give power to the individual, it will eventually kill your society. Diametrically opposed ideologies about how people can be happy and prosperous. And the experiment has run out. We know what happens with communism. Look at, look at Venezuela. Okay, And we know what happens when individual liberty is empowered in the hands of the individual. The American economy, the most powerful economy in the history of mankind, highest quality of living, the highest respect for people. Yes, we're not perfect, but it sure beats the alternative. So that gives you a sense for where we're going over the next few days with this opportunity and this conversation. It sets the foundation for these three key pillars of prosperity, transportation, information, and energy, and what space means, and the way to tell these stories to people who may not understand the mindset of how dramatically this is gonna be. And it's gonna be faster than transitioning from the horse and the candle and the pot belly stove to airplanes, spaceships, and uh, smartphones. Okay, I'll stop there and let you ask questions and let's see where you wanna take this. I'm all ears. Wow, sir, thank you very much. That was, uh, that was enlightening and powerful and uh, absolutely fascinating. The way that you described um, uh, energy and communications and transportation, those three critical essential infrastructures are all entwined uh, you can have an advantage in one, but if you lose the, the advantage in the others, you're still uh, at risk. Um, that was that was absolutely uh, awesome. So Michael, um, one thing I, I want to tell you uh, though, to kind of punctuate that is that they intersect in space in ways that they don't intersect on Earth. Um, oh. in some degree. For example, let's take robotics. Okay. Robotics in space, if you have beamed energy from the sun and you have 5G and you have robotics in space, now you can do things in space you could, you could never do anywhere else. Infinite energy, zero latency, and robotics that can communicate and do things. So you can, you know, you, you can see how powerful this is as you blend these three capabilities together in robotics, for example. And you know, th this is a part of you know, the, the Space Force law was designed. This conversation I just had with you, I had with every single member of Congress that had a role in voting on that Space Force legislation and showing them what China was doing in the classified world and what America was not doing is what allowed us to have a Space Force, its first anniversary right now, in the midst of an impeachment where each side was fighting like cats and dogs, but behind closed doors in a classified conversation with me, 
they were singing Kumbaya about the Space Force, even though it's joked about, yep. laughed about, yep. Netflix has the, the you know, comedy about, it would be like people laughing about the idea of an automobile in 1850, right. or laughing about the idea of a plane. You know, the front page of the New York, in fact, the front page of the New York Times on October 9th, 1903, said that even if we spent all our money on the best scientists in the world, it would be 1 million to 10 million years before we build an airplane. And the Wright brothers, two and a half months later, flew at Kitty Hawk Kill Devil. So, um, you know, and, and the Space Force is still a joke in many of the minds of the status quo in the military. They, they do not see this power coming to the shores of humanity. And I'm glad all of you do. So Michael, again, open to questions here. Well, so you know that I'm a big fan of Space Force, so I could talk about that all all afternoon. Um, I do have a few questions, but I want to I want to throw the mic over to Michael Mealing. Um, he is uh, a venture capitalist and a partner at uh, Starbridge, um, and he made a comment in the chat that I thought was pretty relevant rel relating to his conversations in. Congress. So could you all just chat for a second about, uh, Michael, your experiences? Sure. Um, I, I want to go back to something you said uh, toward the beginning. Um, basically, you know, it, this stuff is going to take, you know, a thousand years. Well, that that is um, divided in half. They said 500 years. But in um, through the context of the Alliance for Space Development, which is you know, Mars Society, NSS, and a whole bunch of different organizations that routinely talk to people on the Hill um, with, a, with a few rare exceptions, probably the same ones that you know. Um, the statement that we always get back from staffers is, um, sorry, but my member is not going to be wasting political capital on something that is at least 500 years in the future. Um, stop watching Star Trek and go away. Um, and the, the problem that we, we seem to have is, yes, it is failure of imagination, but depending on how we try to phrase the question, it is also a failure of, um, or at least a view that by some members that the U.S. should no longer be an expansionist power. Um, right. And the... We struggle with that, and we get that from both uh, both sides of the aisle. And um, the only way that we sort of can figure out how to get around this, um, and I hate to say to sneak it in the back door, but as um, Scott Pace suggests, has suggested a couple of times, um, using the International Development Finance Corporation to pull it out of Congress and actually put it into the hands of um, a development bank. And I think the issue is, um, has been stated by several uh, members lately, the overhang of coronavirus related spending at the state level and the federal level um, means that whenever we go for this ask, um, we get shown the door. Uh, do you have any counter experience um, that suggests there's hope or um, is, as Scott suggests, um, we go to the IDFC and, and get um, a couple of friendly senators to go on board with changing their, their charter. Yeah, so, you know, this, um, I, I probably spot, I fought for uh, 20 years to get a Space Force uh, injected internal into the Air Force, uh, whether it was my writings as a student or when I was in charge sure, of the you? Yeah. yeah, okay, just speak a little louder. Yes, okay. sir, thank you. So, you, you, you know, I'll, I'll keep this question short because it's, uh, you know, we could spend the entire time on this. It's a real important one. Congress is stuck in three different uh, problems and they're problems rooted in human nature. So you can't be angry at them, but you're right. They, they are trapped in a lack of vision. Um, and, um, you know, as uh, the great academic uh, Dr. Fisher uh, pointed out to the English after they lost an entire generation of men because they didn't properly anticipate the machine gun or gas in trench warfare. He said, we lost a generation of men because we had a lack of vision. We had good generals, we had good technology, we had you know, decent strategies, but mm -hmm. we lost because of a lack of vision. So the inability to have vision um, is part of it. Part of it is this tyranny of the temporal dimension. 
Uh, it happened with the railroads too. When people brought to Congress in the mid 1800s, the idea of railroads out to the West, out to California, um, the technology was still kind of new like we are with space and Congress said, come back in a hundred years. Um, you know, you're, you're too soon. And then a few years later, we broke through. So Congress will always be behind the scene, uh, behind a little bit on that, but it's the nature of politics and you're not gonna overcome that. The nature of politics is that politicians will not make a decision to stick their neck out there unless their constituency is telling them to do it. And that usually requires a crisis where the constituency is afraid or it takes them actually seeing something real that proves the economic and political value to them. So, um, you know, there's really no way out of this dilemma because it's human nature and it's politics. And I run into the same thing. But what I found is finding the key people that have vision in Congress and letting them um, go on this journey of conversation does help. And the law is powerful. And if you can get laws written, that's good. The idea of moving this out into a other than government place is good, but they're gonna come in, they're gonna have some of the same problems where they look at the business case and they're gonna, they're gonna wanna see is this real or not? And uh, you're gonna find that the speed is not there. This is why Teddy Roosevelt was able to build the Panama Canal. Because if you have the right leader with the right vision, a government partnership can let you move fast because they align strategic objectives with the company and they accelerate beyond the company's competition. Um, if we don't get the American government to help us accelerate into space, we're gonna lose to China because China has aligned all their companies and their capital behind the vision of space, which is their national vision. And everybody works for the central party. So this competition between China and America is gonna be lost unless we convince this government, whether it's in the vision of a president that can get Congress behind them, or whether it's Congress that gets the president behind them. We need visionaries at this moment in time politically to join with the private companies to accelerate their journey. Otherwise, Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos and others, they'll get there, but they will get there after China gets there, no matter, because it's just a high price point of entry. And uh, billionaires only have so much money they can throw after it. And the government provides this weight of, of, of wealth that nobody else can compete with. And, and just to point out how dangerous China is, most people think about China right now in this competition in Cold War mindset. Well, this is just like the Soviet Union back in the 60s and 70s. Nothing could be further from the truth. At the height of the Cold War, the Soviet Union only had about 50% of the economic throw weight of America. And right now, China has more throw weight. Even though they are the second largest economy in the world, because of their political system and because every company and every organization works for the Central Communist Party, they have more economic throw weight than America and they're doing something with it. And if we don't get the American government to realize this, we're, we're gonna lose to China. And this gets back to the final mental paradigm Congress is stuck in. And this one I actually had some success with. And that is the trap of putting the urgent in front, in front of the important. There's a lot of things that feel urgent, you know, the alligator closest to the canoe. Um, and so it's like you're sitting in a canoe and there's an alligator right there and you're trying to bat down the alligator, but you are not looking at the ship that's gonna just cut you in half and eviscerate you if you don't paddle out of its way. So this is Congress saying, hey, COVID-19, I, I don't have time to mess with this space stuff and it's 500 years away. That is them putting the urgent in front of the important because no matter what we do with COVID and God willing, we get rid of this with vaccines and therapeutics quickly. But if, we, if nothing happens and we just focus on COVID, we're gonna lose our Republic. And then people will say, well, which one was more important? Well, we were able to live even though it was hard with COVID. But if we don't pay attention to space, we're not gonna have an America to do anything with any health issue. So those are the three traps cognitively You've described them all. It's just our lot in life to help people crawl out of those traps and see what's really going on in front of us.
Okay. I, I guess uh, I'm looking for um, shorter term strategies that don't have to wait on the right president or the right vice president in the case of the National Space Council um, to come along and do that because uh, it, it it is rare for Congress to be or, or a president to be able to lead like that. Yeah. And um, I think there is plenty of leadership in the space sector from Elon and you know a lot of the, the same people that we know. Um, but I think there are some tools, especially if you look at how much the International um, Development Finance Corporation is actually allocated versus how much it's actually spent. No, um, so keep, keep pushing on that, but uh, to some degree you push on a rope. Uh, the most powerful short-term thing we can do is what was already mentioned in this conversation, and that is the American people. If the American people uh, through the power of networks, you know, if, if all of us talk to 10 people and ask them to talk to 10 other people and perpetuate that about the power of space and the consequences, both the blessings and the curses, if America does not lead, um, you could change Congress overnight. So do not underestimate the power of the American people. And uh, the, the number of people that are stuck in this paradigm that we, we should not be expansionist, that we should ignore space because it would be immoral because somehow we're gonna do harm to other people if we move into space or are competitive. Um, those are few and far between. Any person that has studied history and has studied human nature understands that if you don't compete, you just become the slave of those that are willing to compete. You know, power is a funny thing. It's played out this way since the beginning of time. You either have it and your values rule or you do not have it and you must submit. Thanks for that. Uh, we, we should chat about a couple of things uh, offline. Uh, okay, Michael, yes, any other questions you wanna get after? I know we have about three minutes left on the timeline. Yes, sir. Uh, there was a quick question from Robert Jenkins. I'm uh, not sure what you're asking. And Robert, you uh, only have just a moment. <laughs> okay, and I guess, I was going to ask you how you know it was quick, but that's because I only have a moment. So, yes. Yeah, so, yeah, it's not going to be quick. I'll hold it. I'll okay. send it to Tim. <laughs> okay. All right. Great. Um, well, then we're going to probably use this to uh, to kind of wind down. Uh, sir, really appreciate your time and your wisdom uh, joining us on the beginning of what I think is going to be a really fascinating journey this this upcoming year. Um, uh, is there anything uh, that you'd like to share as kind of last second thoughts? Um, uh, or if you could take just two minutes to think about what the near future looks like, 2022, 2025. If you had a crystal ball or a wish list, what would that look like? Well, um, in the... Uh the two minutes to kind of solve world hunger there on that one or boy, we're looking at <laughs> yes, sir. while you're at it. Yeah. I would say, you know, the, 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 uh, the ability to prioritize what we need to do first is, is really important. And what I would do is I would connect space with some of the things that we need to do first as a society. And one of the first things we need to do is we need to build gateways where people can trust their data and they can protect their independence, their civil liberties and their privacy. Um, and space can do that for us. America and, and the brilliant in, innovators in private industry could build us gateways in space that could allow every American to, to communicate with one another and with anybody on the planet and have their data protected and protect their civil liberties, their independence, where Big Brother cannot look in on you, and, you know, all, and, and their civil liberties. Um, so that would be job number one, because then you can actually triangulate truth and you know what to do. Job number two would be um, to get this government to realize that the transportation revolution for the American economy will be as big as shipbuilding industry and deep sea navigation was for the English several hundred years ago. And that if we invest in this, it will raise all ships. Um, and then the third is energy and for America to invest using space. So connect these all to space, invest 
in a space solar energy grid that beams safe power to devices globally. And we can rid our world of fossil fuel over time at affordable price points that nobody could even start competing with because you require no terrestrial investment in capital. And uh, so these, these would be the three steps consistent with the three principles I talked to, but start with information because if China can lie to the world, our stock market crashes. And if our stock market crashes and we can't, we can't uncover the lie, we can't reveal truth because our information systems are, are sub subordinate to China's and our victim of 5G and quantum, then the lights are out and the, 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 you know, the, the jig is up for our constitution and the American way of life. You're on mute. There. Terrific, sir. Thank you very much. Really, really grateful for you, having you here today. Uh, it's inspiring and, and informational all at the same time. Well, I'll be tracking your whole thing, and uh, these next few days are going to be very inspiring. So thank you for letting it me It really talk. is. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.